join our Patreon. Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You guys don't want to miss this show. I'm going to tell you what, <laughs> I have a, a brilliant uh, critical scholar here today. You really do not want to miss this show. I, I cannot stress that enough. Dr. John J. Collins, welcome to the show. How are you doing, brother? Doing fine. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, uh, I got to go ahead and give people a little bit of, uh, I guess you'd say, a short bio, what I... What I'd like to say, if you will, uh, uh, John has been studying the biblical text for quite a long time. I, 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 let me call you Dr. Collins for now until you tell me. Yes, sir. Dr. Collins has studied a lot. He's written lots of books. So go down in the description. I'll tell you right now, you need to get some of this material and read it for yourself. Uh, I'm briefly scratching the surface with him. Um, he, his title has been, and I don't know if you're currently still a professor of Old Testament criticism and interpretation at Yale Divinity School. That's right. Yes, sir. And the, the greatest part about uh, Dr. Collins is his spouse, and, and, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this correct, Adela Collins? Yes. Yes. She's, she's the queen. <laughs> Yes, sir. He has a bachelor's degree in 1967. He received uh, a master's in 1969 and the PhD in 1972. Uh, he's been to University of Notre Dame, Harvard, uh, University of Chicago, Yale Divinity School, and his main subjects or interest is Second Temple Judaism in the Hellenistic era, or the Hellenistic era, Dead Sea Scrolls, and apocalyptic there's so much stuff that i can't even cover it all we'd be wasting the hour that i get to share with you so thank you for joining me yes sir we have a lot of works guys like i said check out the description i don't want to list off all the books but there's some wonderful shows we can produce with you and i'd like to kick start us off with the first question uh, i sent you the email of and uh let's get started uh, we talk about uh, uh they're framed in the context of biblical discussion of early Christianity because it's one of my keen interests, but this is not Christianity, so to speak. We're talking about Daniel. Um, however, it relates because the New Testament utilizes it often. And so let's go ahead and ask a basic question. What got you interested, Dr. Collins, in the book of Daniel and particularly motivating you to dedicate so much time and energy into that particular book? Well, uh, I got into this field, uh, you might say, by accident. When I was 12 years old, I, was, I got a scholarship to a boarding school that was run by a religious order in Ireland. And when I got there, the dean of students called out 12 of us one evening and said, you're going to do Greek. Now, in those days, we all had to do Latin. You had to have Latin to matriculate. So I did Greek. Two of us liked it and stuck with it for five years. So at the end of that time, I joined that religious order. And then uh, I came along and um, they said, what do you want to do at the university? And I said, I'd like to do classics. And they said, well, you can do classics if you'll also do Hebrew. And then you can teach scripture. So I said, okay, why not? <laughs> so <laughs> this is how for my undergraduate degree, I did Greek and Hebrew, basically. And uh, that focused my interest on the, the Hellenistic period, you know, when the biblical period was exposed to Greek culture. Now, that was the time when the book of Daniel was written, the time of the Maccabean revolt, there were all sorts of interesting developments. It's a big shift, really, from the worldview of ancient Israel to what you'll find in the New Testament. And that shift was largely due to the Hellenistic age. So then uh, I was allowed to go to Harvard to do a PhD. And... Uh, when I was there, there was a young professor who had just joined the faculty named Paul Hansen. And uh, he had just written a book that he published a few years later called The Dawn of Apocalyptic. And so he was all fired up about apocalypticism. 
but he identified apocalypticism with uh, the, the, what you get in the later prophets after the exile. And I had already done a bit of work on this, and I figured, no, it's really more a Hellenistic phenomenon. And so that's really what got me started on Daniel, was to make my argument <laughs> in part, I mean, I was also very much indebted to Paul Hansen, and I feel very grateful to the man and very fond of him, because, you know, he got me launched, and my, my wife too, actually, uh, because we met there, that's actually where we got to know each other, was in his course on the Jewish apocalyptic literature. But that's, in any case, how I got interested in it. And I came into it, you see, with the angle of interest that what, what you get in the Hellenistic period is different from what you had at the earlier period. Interesting, Dr. Collins. This is interesting. Great way to catapult us off into Daniel because it's thick. So if you're new to this, uh, if you're not familiar too much with the critical scholarship, which I myself am not, I'm, I'm here to host a critical scholar on this subject. Uh, stay tuned. You're going to learn and listen to a lot of interesting things today that are discussed by Dr. Collins. First question that we'll get into here. I'm going to give you the chunk here, this whole little paragraph. Okay. So if you want to chew away at it, uh, at whatever you feel like uh, answering you think is most important out of this, you'll get the gist of where, where these questions come from. You argue that there were interpretations of Daniel 7 before Christianity that established the apocalyptic concept of a pre-existent angelic son of man figure identified with Michael who was messianic in the heavenly, not the royal sense, but in the heavenly sense. Uh, what is the rationale of interpreting this figure only as a symbol for Israel, because there's the two competing ideas, and why is the angelic interpretation more persuasive to scholars who read Daniel in the context of ancient myth and of the non-canonical apocalypses and the Dead Sea Scrolls? This runs counter to scholarship that posits this as a Christian development, in particularly that, or in particular, that took place after Jesus' death. Can you explain why you think those scholars are wrong and why you conclude that Jesus himself must have drawn from this tradition in his own teachings as opposed to being inventions of the gospel writers? That's a lot, guys. I know. I just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just say a couple of things, first of all, uh, because there are a lot of people, a lot of conservative Christians, think that Daniel was a prophet who wrote in the Babylonian exile and predicted all sorts of things that would happen hundreds of years later. Now, I'm operating from a different set of assumptions because my assumption is that the text, first of all, had to make sense in the context in which it was written. It had to be intelligible. You might find other meaning in it a couple of hundred years later, but it had to make sense in its original context. So in the case of Daniel, at least at the second half of the book of Daniel, Daniel 7 to 12, there are some very explicit references to the persecution of the Jews by Antiochus Epiphanes that led to the Maccabean revolt. This was 168 to 164 BC. So Daniel was a fictitious character. There are lots of books like this that were attributed to people who couldn't possibly have written them. But that wasn't deception, really. It was a, a, a literary convention. It was something, it was an accepted style of writing. Now, again, if you're familiar with Daniel chapter 7, this is one of the great chapters of the Hebrew Bible. You know, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four big beasts come up out of the sea, and they're terrifying. And then Daniel sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, and he comes before another figure who is an ancient of days, who has a white head, hair, head of hair, and they're surrounded by a thousand times 10,000, and um, then there's a judgment scene, and the beast is destroyed. And then an angel gives Daniel an explanation of this, in which he says, first of all, that the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom. And then later in the explanation, he says, and the kingdom will be given to the people of the holy ones of the most high. Now, 
what misleads a lot of people uh, is that they misunderstand what is meant by the holy ones or the saints of the Most High. In Christianity, saints came to be a name for holy people. In the ancient world, it was nearly always heavenly beings or angels. I think there is one reference in one psalm where the holy ones refer to Israel. But there must be hundreds where it refers to angelic beings. And even in the book of Daniel itself, in Daniel chapter 4, he sees a figure uh, who is called a watcher and a holy one. And it's obviously what we would call an angel. Also, when angels appear in this literature, they look like men. You know, the beasts stand for kings or kingdoms. Uh, the, the human figure is a heavenly figure. So he's like a son of man. He isn't actually a son of man. So because, though, of that language, and because it is obviously addressing the situation of the persecution, um, some people have just assumed that the Holy Ones must be Israel and that the one like a son of man is just a collective representation. But that, to my mind, just misses the symbolism of the whole thing. Because running through the whole second half of the book of Daniel, Daniel is a visionary. He has insight into a hidden world, a world beyond this one a world people by angels and to some degree by demons. Now, uh, he will be told later in the book that the real battle is going on between the Archangel Michael and the Prince of Persia. You might think this is a fight between Jews and Gentiles, but really what's going on is their patron angels. You know, in an earlier period, people would just have said they're gods. But their patron angels, angels are like little gods. <laughs> you know, angels are not on a par with the most high, but they're on the, you know, they don't die. And that's the big difference between a divine being and a non-divine being. So uh, that's the, the, the setting in the book of Daniel. At the end of the book, it says, Michael will arise in victory. And that's, I think, the same thing that is being said as when it says, one like a son of man will come in the clouds of heaven. You, you answered okay. that really, really well, yeah. And another thing I might say about that is that uh, the imagery that you have in Daniel 7 is, I think, rather obviously related to ancient Near Eastern myths. Uh, this is a very common theme in ancient Near Eastern myths that you have a monster coming out of the sea and then a good God, a creator God who vanquishes him in some way. Uh, the particular form of it that you have in Daniel 7, we now understand better because of texts that were found at a place called Ugarit in northern Syria in 1929. And in those texts, you have a high God named Ale, who is a white-headed, ancient figure. And you have a young god who is the rider of the clouds, Baal. Now Baal gets a bad reputation in the Hebrew Bible, but for people in that part of the world, Baal was the god who brought the rain. Baal was the god of life. But now, you see, in the Jewish context, then this seems anomalous because suddenly you have two divine figures. Everywhere else you hear of a figure riding on the clouds of the Hebrew Bible, it turns out to be Yahweh, the God of Israel. Here, it can't be Yahweh, yet that job is already taken. That's the Ancient of Days. So, who is it? <laughs> and this, I think, you see, it's, this is also a new development, really, in this period. Um, because before this period, you don't have any angels known by name. And you don't have uh, an angel who is the designated prince of Israel, like the patron angel of Israel. But that's what Michael is here. 
And so that is why I think it is Michael. Now, I mean, they're still hoping for the deliverance of the Jewish people. But it makes a big difference whether you just think, uh, put it in those terms and say you're hoping for the deliverance of the Jewish people. Or if you think that you are hoping that the archangel Michael will defeat the beast that has come up out of the sea. <laughs> because if you put it the latter way, what it shows is you think there's a lot more going on, that it's not just Jews against Greeks, that this is a cosmic struggle. So that's what's going on, I think. I can definitely relate to that. And, you know, there seems to be, and I, I don't, this is not a part of the next question. I want to ask you the next question because we could rabbit trail. And that's what I, I know that at some point we're going to have to do more of these with you. You're, you're very well spoken. I really appreciate that response, but people tend to rationalize, I think, some things that were uh, superstitious, if you will, to the modern eye, but to the ancients, that was the way that they saw things, angelic beings, gods, things like that. And I know there are some rationalists that I have bumped into who want to make uh, Elohim men. Uh, they want to make, yeah. you know, everything's a human explanation. Yeah. And I, I, I don't uh, follow that path. I've, I've thought about it, but it just too many issues arise. So let's jump into the next one. Um, you say, uh, well, let's go to this. In relation to this topic that we've just been on, on the historicity of the interpretation of Daniel 7 and its use in the Gospels, you mentioned that questions related to the historical Jesus are notoriously difficult to resolve, and the, and the controversy is, is likely to continue. Can you elaborate on that real quick? Well, you see, now I'm not a New Testament scholar. Right. That's, that's my wife's job. <laughs> <laughs> But so I, I don't want to wade into that too far. But uh, the problem with the, in interpreting the New Testament is that it's all written after the death of Jesus, perhaps 40 years after or so. Jesus himself didn't write anything. Now, whether he was wise to do that or whether it was a big mistake, you can decide for yourself. But if you don't write your own account of it, people can attribute anything to you. Now, with the best of goodwill, the gospel writers come along 40 to 50 to 60 years after the death of Jesus, and they see everything through the lens of what they had come to believe. Now, according to the New Testament itself, and I see no reason to doubt it, the big transforming thing was that they came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. Make of that what you will, but I, it seems reasonable to me to believe that, that they had visions. Now, again, make what you will of seeing, of having visions. You know, if, if I have a vision, you don't necessarily have the same vision, <laughs> the, same, the same thing. But I think this is what, uh, what had happened. But if you have that vision, and it's more real to you than anything else, it changes the way you see everything. So certainly at that point, his followers believed that he was going to come again on the clouds of heaven. And this text in Daniel 7 was a godsend to them. Because, again, just quoting what it says in the New Testament, uh, some of his followers thought that he would at this time restore the kingdom of Israel. And he didn't. You know, if you went up to Jerusalem with Jesus, expecting that he was going to proclaim the kingdom of God and throw out the Romans, you were in for a huge shock because what happened within a couple of days was he was crucified. You know, it was total disaster. Now, if you thought of the Messiah the way most people did, as somebody who was a mighty warrior, who defeated the, warrior, the opponents of Israel, then Jesus was a failure. Now, what they did was search the scriptures to see if there was another way of understanding him. And now I'm not saying that this is why they came to believe that he had risen from the dead, 
But once they had believed that he was risen from the dead, there was a new possibility. Now, the difficult question is whether Jesus himself had talked about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. All the Gospels claim that he did. And now it's, it's a very tricky business. I would say, if you go on my principle, that a text has to be intelligible in the time in which it was written, that he cannot have spoken openly about he himself coming on the clouds of heaven. But he could very well have talked about you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven without identifying that figure. That would be, quoting the book of Daniel, there were other Jews who were not Christians who quoted the book of Daniel and thought all the early interpretations of it think that that figure is an individual heavenly savior figure. Whether you call, he came to be called a Messiah. He wasn't called a Messiah in the book of Daniel itself but he came to be called a Messiah. So, you see, it is quite possible that Jesus spoke of a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven without identifying himself with that figure. And I don't think anybody would have thought he was that figure while he was still alive. Why would he need to come on the clouds of heaven when he was already there with his feet on the ground? Okay, Dr. Collins, I, I like the way you're looking at it this way. And um, I want to move to the next question, if you don't mind, because I think it probes into some of this stuff in different ways, gives different angles for, for our audience. The Masoretic text and the Theodosian revision of Daniel 9, did I, did I pronounce, pronounce that correct? Yeah. Okay. Of Daniel 9, 26 through 27 has some differences against the old Greek version. For those who are watching and aren't familiar there's uh, discrepancies here in this particular uh, area in Daniel. The former refers to the Messiah or Messiahs being cut off, while the later specifically says that the Messiah will be destroyed. Your commentary mentions that this probably refers to the death of Onias III, but that traditional Christian exegesis connects this even to the death of Christ. Is it possible that this Christological interpretation could have also connected this event to the eschatological prophecy in Daniel 12, the rising of the, of the archangel Michael, the great prince. Is this interpretation also reflected in the Dead Sea Scroll? Uh, I don't know if you have this reference, uh, 11Q13, but, and is it possible that early Christians may have interpreted Michael's rising and his role in executing God's judgment as a prophecy of Christ's resurrection and judgment for our audience it appears that Michael may be cut off, almost like a death or a destruction of Michael, and then he rises again, to give it in basic terms. Anyway. <laughs> uh, a short answer, no. <laughs> okay, so now, the, uh, I don't know of any early Christian text that takes the reference to Michael arising as referring to the resurrection. If you find one, let me know. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Now, you see, the one in chapter 9 talks about uh, a Mashiach, and, uh, an anointed one. Now, you know, if you say, it's the same word that we call Messiah, but it means anointed one. And it doesn't always mean Messiah in the technical sense of the word. So the high priest was an anointed one. You know, the king, if there was a king, would have been an anointed one. And so that's why most people figure that the anointed one who is cut off in Daniel is Onias, is the high priest who was murdered before the Maccabean revolt. Now, you see, there is no precedent before Jesus for thinking that a Messiah would die and rise again. Which harps right back to your point on saying after the death, they're explaining, they're trying to use things to explain. Uh, and, and would that be a reason why Christians run to these passages and go, oh, you know. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, because then you see they go back and they look for anything that can be interpreted as referring to him. Wow. And, you know, they take almost everything that they find. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the book of Hosea, it says, out of Egypt I have called my son. And so whoever wrote the Gospel of Matthew says, Jesus must have been in Egypt. <laughs> you know, no mention of that in Mark, no mention of that in Luke. But that's how he arrives at it. Right. So you know, they infer historical events from the biblical text. That's, the, that's what happens there. Is it possible, I guess, Probin, before we go to the next question, because we only have 30 minutes left, and, and this is so wonderful. I wish I could get you more. We're going to have to try and schedule again. I really enjoy this. Um, is it possible that the New Testament writers who are writing this did the same thing like the Hosea out of Egypt, going to Daniel 9 and referring to this Michael being cut off and then coming back? Yeah, by the way, it's not my, nobody says that Michael is cut okay, off. Okay, sorry, sorry. Right. The it's son of man. Of I apologize. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. I apologize. Uh, is that something the New Testament you think authors did? And do you think, and I guess that touches on mythicism a little bit. Do you think that's where um, the mythicists kind of are looking at that going, hey, we're seeing reference to Daniel. Maybe they thought of uh, their Lord Jesus as an archangel, like this, this figure here. Well, uh, you know, the, the way the early Christians read scripture was illuminated now in the last 70 years or so by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they wrote commentaries on prophetic books. And that's the way they did it, was they took a verse and they said, oh, now this must refer to what's happening to us. And then... They, they match them up. Now, you can see they're doing that also in... So it's kind of a fundamentalist style of interpretation, if you like. You know, it's reading the scripture on the assumption that it's talking about us and what's happening to us now. So you get a lot of that. Wow, that, that makes me actually... It answers some ideas that I have in mind in terms of uh, a whole different subject matter, which has nothing to do with this. Moving on, <laughs> Emmanuel Tov uh, states that most scholars believe that the old Greek version of Daniel 4 through 6 reflects a later reworking of a uh, version like the one found in the Masoretic text while occasionally reflecting an earlier version. But he also mentions that some scholars argue that the old Greek version actually reflects an older text in these sections. Where do you come down on the, this issue? And Wait, where I come down on that, I think that the these are just variant texts, meaning uh, these stories in Daniel 4 to 6, I think, must have originated as kind of folk tales, you know, oral stories. Now, if you have a story that's passed on orally, the odds are that after 10 or 20 years, there will be some quite different versions of it. And I think that's what happened. So you know, when I worked through those, when I was doing my commentary more than 25 years ago now, uh, the, um, uh, what, what struck me is you cannot really show that one of these is derived from the other. Maybe in some cases, yes, but on the whole, it doesn't go consistently. And so I think it's better to just look at these as you have two you have a, a story. You, I go off and tell it a couple of times my way. You go off and tell it a couple of times your way. And by the time we meet again, we've got two quite different stories. <laughs> I think that's what happens in Daniel 4 to 6. You know, you can recognize that it's basically the same story. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the, the pieces have changed. 10.4. Can you explain the prophecy of 70 weeks in Daniel's 9 in layman's terms? In particular, can you explain why this prophecy has been so difficult for readers to interpret over the centuries? And what is the relationship between this prophecy and Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy and the anticipating time of the end times in the first century? Well, the relationship with Jeremiah is easy enough because there's a prophecy in the book of Jeremiah that Jerusalem would be desolate for 70 years. Now, 
in the time of the Maccabees, probably when Jerusalem seemed to be desolate again, people said, what? You know, wasn't this supposed to be only 70 years? Right. And the angel says to Daniel, no, actually, it's 70 weeks of years. Now, this is one of the great things about uh, the apocalyptic way of interpreting texts. If you don't like what it says literally, you can interpret it allegorically. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, you've got to have some kind of a jumping off point. But that's, that's what, what he does. So he says, really, it's not 70 years. It's actually 490 years. Right. Now, even better, he says this when nobody at the time the book of Daniel was written, nobody in Jerusalem knew how long it had been since Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. You know, they didn't have Wikipedia. They didn't even have a good history. They didn't, have, there is no good continuous history, you know, of the Persian period. We, we put our history together by reading the Greek historians and correlating things. So they didn't know how long that was. So, wow. that's, so then the 490 then becomes like a nice rounded symbolic figure. But you could only think that it would be 490 years for so long. You know, you could maybe keep that up for a hundred years if you're hazy as to how much time has passed. But eventually, it dawned on people, it can't have been literally 490 years. And so then somebody got the bright idea that with the Lord, a thousand years is as a day. <laughs> and so th this allowed them then to reinterpret the, the 490 years taking this as, oh, what? I mean, there have been several different ways of doing it. Uh, the most famous one probably was by William Miller in the 1840s, a farmer in Ohio who worked this out, you know, and he calculated that the world was going to end in 1843. And mm. well, this is what gave us the Seventh-day Adventists and other things besides. But it was, you know, a spectacular case of somebody trying to use these texts as quite literal predictive prophecy. There was a case of this, uh, if, what, about seven years ago? A man named Harold Camping, mm -hmm. you know, did, uh, did a calculation too. In, in uh, fairness to Harold Camping, he had the honesty to say afterwards, I guess I was wrong. Yeah, that's... I think he was probably the first apocalyptic prophet who ever said I was wrong. I, my hat goes off to someone who, who's willing to do that at, at the very least. And so in the 490, uh, I guess uh, you, you brought up something interesting since it piggybacks off of Jeremiah, the 70 year here. Oh, yeah. it's, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, and we'll get to the next question. It's pretty much a yes or no, actually. Uh, this sounds like failed prophecy, so now we have, to, uh, we, have to, we have to stretch it. We have to find a way to continue, because if it didn't happen now, our, it's, our God can't be wrong. It's, it's somehow we misunderstood or something. Yeah. Actually, there's a very interesting case of that at the end of the book of Daniel, I didn't bring down a Bible here, so let me see. If I, <laughs> I apologize. Country. But you know, at the very end of the book of Daniel, uh, an angel tells him, uh, one angel asks another, how long is it going to be? And he gives him uh, a number of days. Is it the 1260, 1290, 1335? Yes, yeah. Yes, and then at the very next, next verse, gives him a higher number of days. What happened? Now, to my <laughs> mind, that's a no-brainer. What happened was the first number of days passed. Now, maybe they went back and said, we made a mathematical mistake here somewhere. Uh, I have a friend who teaches at the University of Michigan who would say that, no, uh, that he realized that he was using the wrong calendar. And so he recalculates it. Maybe 
but one way or another, he recalculates. Now, there was a famous study after Miller, after William Miller and the Millerite movement in the 1840s. It's a famous study by a sociologist, Leon Festinger, called When Prophecy Fails. And according to Festinger, you know, the first thing, the first reaction is maybe God gave us an extension. Or we made a mistake. We miscalculated. You know, we didn't make, we weren't completely wrong. It's just, we, we just, uh, yeah, miscalculated, got our math wrong. And so very often in a case like that, people will recalculate and postpone a little. And I think that's what happened in the book of Daniel. And then, you know, after a while they say, oh, it must have a symbolic meaning. Maybe it's thousands of years. <laughs> You know, that's funny. I, I actually have a good friend of mine who actually believes the numbers represent something else. So it's, yeah. there's always some type, like uh, there's always something uh, that, that is explained, in my opinion, to try and justify or rectify possible actual felled uh, tendencies here. But uh, it, it, I, I'm glad I heard you say that because not rabbit trailing, but just mentioning the, there's a group, like I said, full preterist that I came from prior to us hitting the record button. They believe the prophecies of the new Testament were written after the things happened to make them appear fulfilled. However, you then have to say resurrection wasn't literal. Uh, the judgment was about the temple in 70. It had nothing to do with the final. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, next question. <laughs> <laughs> if it's generally agreed that the tells in Daniel 1 through 6 may have evolved over centuries before the composition of the vision uh, in chapter 7 through 12, how would you date the literary development of the forerunner to this section of the text? Oh, you know, it's very, very hard to know when the stories originated. But now in the case that we can trace best is the story of Nebuchadnezzar's madness in Daniel chapter four. And sometime oh, back uh, almost a hundred years ago, um, an Assyriologist named Van Soden figured out that this must have been originally about a different Babylonian king named Nabonidus. Now, Nabonidus had, was the last king of Babylon, but he went off into the wilderness, into Tema, a city out in the Arabian desert, and became obsessed with the cult of the moon god. And the clergy in Babylon thought he was mad and despised him. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as it happens, they found something called the Prayer of Nabonidus, which you know, shows an intermediate stage, if you like, of that story, where it's still Nabonidus. Now, he doesn't become like an animal the way he does in, in Daniel, but, but he is afflicted for a period of years, and then a Jewish seer comes along and interprets his illness, and he's cured. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the Nebuchadnezzar tell here in, yeah. in Daniel. So... You can see, you know, this went through a number of stages like this. It could have taken a couple of hundred years. I think the stories, some of the stories in Daniel 2 to 6 were probably written down late in the 3rd century, maybe. Late 3rd, early 2nd century. Not that long before Daniel. I would have figured that there was probably some connection between the people who wrote down the stories of the stories about Daniel and then the people who had the visions in the name of Daniel. That leads us to another question and hopefully we can get to these. I hope I can get there. We got 20 minutes approximately left. Um, let's just move to why is there controversy surrounding the pseudo Danilic literature found at Qumran and in particularly whether or not they are dependent on the biblical text of Daniel? Well, you see, when they, so first of all, everybody may not know what these pseudo danielic texts are. They're very, very fragmentary texts to begin with. But there are three of them that actually mention Daniel. And they are predictions. Well, when I say three of them, two of them actually are copies of the same thing. And the third one even could be part of the same, but maybe not. 
So these were predictions in the name of Daniel, but there aren't actually any close contact points with the biblical text. So when these were first found, the assumption was, if you find something that looks like a biblical text, the biblical text must have come first. Now, that does not hold, actually. And so when people got over that <laughs> after a while, <laughs> they realized, no, there were probably other stories in circulation about Daniel. So it isn't clear, you know, did the biblical text come first here? Or did these come first? Or were they just different stories in the name of Daniel? You see, already in the, the Greek Bible and also in the Catholic Bible, we have two more stories about Daniel, Baal and the dragon and Susanna. Now, Susanna is a very different kind of story. You know, this is Daniel as the wise young man who, who judges a case. And that has really nothing to do with the the other stories in the book of Daniel. But it shows, you know, Daniel was a figure about whom people told stories. So that's Excellent. what's going on there. Excellent. If the Greek editions and this uh, pseudo-Danielic, I always pronounce these funny, literature from Qumran show that there used to be a wider corpus of Danielic literature, why was it not preserved? Do you think first century Jews, such as early Christians, would have had access to these lost uh, traditions? First of all, it's not only Daniel. Look, we have uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found roughly a thousand manuscripts, give or take a hundred maybe. <laughs> but, but because they're fragmentary enough and it's hard to know uh, whether it's the same manuscript or not. But anyhow, the, you had a huge collection of literature. Now, that included not only pseudo-Daniel texts, it also included pseudo-Ezekiel texts, pseudo-Jeremiah texts, and so forth. And I, I have a good friend, you know, who argues vehemently we should not call them pseudo. These were as authentic as anything else. You know, these were just prophecies in the name of these figures circulating. There was a huge literature in the name of Enoch. And Enoch now was known because Enoch then became canonical in, in uh, Ethiopia. And that the books of Enoch have been in continuous use for 2,000 years. Uh, it was only rediscovered in the Western world at the beginning, at the end of the, uh, the 19th, at the end of the 18th century, and, and brought back by a Scottish traveler. So you know, there was a huge literature there. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they seem to regard some of that literature as just as inspired as anything else. Fair so, enough. <laughs> so what we have is a small selection. And now the principles of selection there, you know, that's a, that's a difficult enough thing to establish. It is not necessarily the case that if they, ex if they didn't preserve a book, that there was something wrong with it. It's just some books didn't make the cut. You know, nowadays, there were a lot of books published 50 years ago. Now, there are some of those that we still read and think are very important. And some of them are completely forgotten. So every now and then somebody will rediscover one of these ones that was forgotten and found, gee, this was a good book. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's what happens. It's a kind of uh, survival of the fittest, natural <laughs> selection, whatever. <laughs> but uh, that, that you end up with some books that make it, that kind of become classics. Sounds and, good. and that's what happens. You know, they didn't actually try to define which books were in and which books were out until the, the church councils. And uh, even then, it was really the Reformation. I think that tried to draw a really hard line on that. Right. And didn't entirely succeed, I might say. Hmm. Because if you get a new Oxford Bible with Apocrypha, you, know, you will find some books in there that nobody regarded as canonical. But they're back in the Bible now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dr. Collins, how did Daniel attain authoritative status? You wrote that in, in your uh, commentator. Uh, so short after its composition, as seen from citations in the Dead Sea Scrolls, can the same be said about the book of One Enoch and Jubilees, which date to roughly the same as Daniel and were represented by doven, dozens of copies at the Qumran? Yes, I think it can, actually. Um, you know, that they, they were well known. Daniel became better known. Daniel circulated more widely. Why? Well, I suspect because Daniel is more like the Hebrew prophets. You know, the book of Enoch has some pretty strange stuff in there. And if you read the book of Enoch, you know, he's going off through the heavens and seeing visions of heaven and hell and all the rest of it. And uh, this, this was different. Now, Daniel may have been different too, but the similarities to some of the prophets were much greater in the case of Daniel. Uh, but I do think, though, that as you say, you also had books of Enoch that some people accepted as authentic uh, right away, pretty much right from the time that they were written. That's a puzzle to us because, you know, in the case of Enoch, you ask yourself, how could anybody think? that Enoch, who had supposedly lived before the flood, had suddenly started to publish. <laughs> I like to tell graduate students that they should look on Enoch as a great source of encouragement. If you're slow to publish, nobody is as slow <laughs> as Enoch was. Oh, that's a great, that's a great he, example. He made it big time when he, when he got going. Excellent. Thank you for answering that. How is Daniel related to other non-canonical Jewish writings of the Hellenistic age? And which of these may have been sources for some of the materials in, in Daniel? How is this kind of late prophetic writing distinct from older biblical prophecy? I don't know if that's a little complicated to get into, but... Well, no, actually, because I mean, what, uh, Daniel, to my mind, represents a new kind of writing in Judaism that we call apocalyptic. Now, you also get this in the writings attributed to Enoch. What's different about them? Now, from a formal point of view, the books of Daniel and Enoch, uh, you know, they're not, Daniel doesn't get inspired the way Jeremiah did. Jeremiah, you know, would say, thus says the Lord. Daniel never says, thus says the Lord. Daniel has a vision and it's interpreted for him by an angel. Now, that wasn't entirely new, because that happened to Ezekiel, that happened to Zechariah, there were precedents for it. But that's one, you know, it's a difference in, in degree to some extent. Now, in the book of Daniel and in the book of Enoch, you have a lot more angels and demons than you would have had at any earlier time. Now, it's not that people didn't have mythology in the earlier parts of the Hebrew Bible <laughs> or believe in many different divine beings. Yes, they did, but it's a matter of degree again. And then the real clencher, to my mind, the thing that makes the biggest difference is that Daniel affirms a judgment of the dead. Now, that, to my mind, is the big game changer. Enoch also has that. This is something that comes into the Jewish tradition first in the apocalyptic literature. Now, you know, there were, there was, this belief was current in Greece. Plato had it. Doesn't mean that everybody believed it. Uh, there were precedents for it in Egypt, possibly in Persia. But it had never caught on in Judaism until the books of Enoch and Daniel, so probably early second century BC. Now, this to my mind is the game changer because if you really believe it, it changes your whole outlook on life. In the modern world, I think there are lots of Christians who say they believe in resurrection and afterlife, but you know, it, it's not deep down in them. It doesn't sink into the point where they live out of that belief. Now, if you did really believe in it, 
then you know, the important thing is to go to heaven and be with the angels. Whereas up to this point in Judaism, the important thing was to live a long life and see your children and your children's children. If you believe that it's all about going to heaven, well then, uh, that doesn't matter so much. It changes the ball game. Yes, it does. <laughs> do, you, do you think that the do you think the book of Daniel was uh, uh, like clo- was it closed by the time of Daniel, the prophetic canon, and and then Daniel pops up after? Well, you know, we shouldn't really speak of a canon. Properly speaking, um, I'd say the conventional wisdom is that the book of Ben Sirah was written early in the second century, a little bit before Daniel. It was translated by his grandson towards the end of the second century. And the grandson says that my grandfather, Jesus, <laughs> was deep, you know, was at a study the law and the prophets and the other writings. And he was moved to write something similar himself. Now, most people would figure that the law there is what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books that the prophets are, you know, both the former prophets, that Samuel and Kings, and also the, the books we call the prophets. But you see, we don't actually know how fixed any of that was. In the Greek Bible, Daniel is included in the prophets. In the Hebrew Bible, it isn't. Now, why? One explanation would be that they had already decided that which prophetic books were in. And that may be, but there could be a different reason for it because, you see, Daniel is a hybrid book. And if you think of Daniel in terms of the stories in the first half of the book, well, then it isn't like the prophets. You wouldn't expect it to be put in. So I think nowadays, in light of the Dead Sea Scrolls especially, people realize there may have been a lot more debate and a lot more variation as to what was in and what was not in, even in the Pentateuch. You know, that there were other books like the Book of Jubilees and the Temple Scroll at Qumran, and some people may have regarded these as part of the Law of Moses. It's not sure, but it's a possibility. And there certainly were plenty of prophetic writings around besides the ones that we we finally got in the canon. You answered that very well. <laughs> I'm glad you're making these these sweet and to the point too, because we're getting close. Can you can you summarize the phenomena of the persistent cultural legacy of Assyria and Babylon and Judaism of the Hellenistic period, based on the story? I know, I know, that's going to be hard. I don't know. Do you think we should skip that one for? for... It's too too big a question. Okay. Uh, I mean that that's that is very complex. <laughs> and in fact, it's something that there's a lot of, of work being done on nowadays. Uh, there's a lot more interest now than there used to be on the Babylonian literature of the late period. Okay. Because people were originally more interested in the early period. But it's obvious there was a lot of Babylonian and Assyrian uh, influence in the Hellenistic world. And you see, Hellenism isn't just the Greeks. Hellenism is the meeting of East and West. It's the interpenetration of ideas coming from Greece and ideas coming from Babylon and, um, and Assyria. In the case of the book of Daniel, you know, the first half of the book, uh, a lot of it is, is uh, couched, set at the Babylonian court. There is, uh, it helps to know something about Babylonian divination. These things were still around. I like how you said that, how these, uh, the crossroads, it's not a one-way street. Greece was not just hammering their views to everywhere. It was that with the idea of more, and that was well put. Uh, You've stated, this is our last bulk, and then I wanted to ask you one question about the Maskalim, and and, and then we'll end out this, because I have a good friend of mine who brought them up, and you're actually the second person who's who's emphasized this in their commentary. 
Um, you stated that Daniel is the only book, and this is a big one here, uh, the only book in the Hebrew Bible that speaks clearly of individual resurrection in chapter 12. Specifically, yeah. it states, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these, t- uh, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Bart Ehrman discusses this passage in his recent book, Heaven and Hell, where he asserts that this everlasting contempt refers to annihilation and not eternal damnation or torment. The the thesis of his book was that the historical Jesus was an annihilationist who did not believe in the concept of eternal conscious torment of the dead, since it was only the hellfire itself that described as eternal. Your commentary also affirms that Daniel does not elaborate on the punishment of the damned. Do you have any additional thoughts on this? Well, uh, I don't agree with my good friend Bart on that one. Uh, I think there were some, uh, what did you call them, annihilationists. There's a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, written in Greek around the time of Jesus. And in that, I think the idea is that if you don't believe in an afterlife, you won't get one. You just disappear. But that's not what you typically get in the apocalyptic literature. You know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're fairly explicit that, that you know, there will be a fiery, place of punishment. Now, Daniel doesn't elaborate on it, but when he says that some will be raised for shame and everlasting contempt, uh, well, they will be raised. It isn't so clear whether they'll be kept alive for it. You have maybe a very rudimentary idea of hell there. I think by the time you get to Jesus in the first century, the, the idea of Gehenna, which Barrett also talks about, um, Gehenna, you know, was originally the the valley outside Jerusalem where they burned the garbage. But that's not how it's used in the New Testament. You know, it's a metaphor for a fiery place of punishment. See, that's what I thought. There was an idea of a hell. Uh, it, it, uh, It was developed. This was early days for hell. I like how you put that too. Developers went to work on it after that. Right. You mentioned how Daniel doesn't really like, it doesn't, if, if the concept's floating around, it's not explicitly well put in Daniel enough for us to say, oh yeah, eternal conscious torment or, yeah. yeah. Last thing I got for you here, and um, I think the rapture's about to happen. So uh, <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the Hasidim, uh, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, is a, they were, uh, say that again? Hasidim. Hasidim. They were the militant Maccabeans, and then you juxtaposed were given examples of the Maskalim. Um, I kind of wanted to ask, do you think, and this might be a simple yes or no, but I would love a little bit more on the Maskalim, if you don't mind mentioning, uh, over against the Hasidim. Uh, Paul, is Paul in the New Testament trying to maybe in some way run into a tradition of the masculine in a sense? I was wanting to know your thoughts if that was something possible. I know a lot of Stoicism and I know a Platonic thought permeates in Paul. I just didn't know if you thought maybe some ideas of the masculine are being utilized in Paul's writings from your perception? No, the word masculine is a word that's used in Daniel 11 and 12. It means the wise. Presumably, these were the circles in which the book of Daniel was written. They're the good guys in the time of persecution. Now, it's not, it doesn't become really a religious type. Hasidim did, the Hasidim of the pious. You will still find Hasidim. All you have to do is go to Brooklyn. You can see them walking the streets, dressed up in their hats and got those what. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but masculine, you know, doesn't become a type to that degree. So I don't think it makes any sense to talk about Paul doing anything with the masculine. Did the, the Hasidim exist in, in the latter first century? Would you think they're the Qumran sect or uh, you know, possibly? Uh, I mean, they, they, yes, they, the Qumran sect, I think, would probably accept the designation of Hasidim. That doesn't mean, you know, it's a general term. Right. It's kind of like evangelical or fundamentalist even. You know, <laughs> these are typically terms outsiders use to group people, but they don't necessarily all agree among themselves. 
Well put, Dr. Collins. Thank you so much for this okay. interview. And we have much more to come. Ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description. Check out his material. He's got a lot of books. You really should get well, well read on this material. And if you guys have any questions, comment down. You know my email, mythvisionpodcast at gmail.com. And all the links to, to Dr. Collins' materials and stuff will be down there as well. Thank you for joining me. Let's do this again sometime. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Join our Patreon. Fish.